I was thinking that this week Elder Peter is going to minister and therefore I had uh, preached my Palm Sunday message in advance last week. And uh, I told you how Jesus Christ purposely manifested his divine credentials as a prophet and a priest and a coming king and messiah willfully so that you and I can trust him, you and I can put our faith and hope on him knowing that he is the promised Messiah who came to take away our sins and who came to redeem us and to deliver us. Today I want you to go back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 17 and my talk today would be are you a stumbling block or a stepping stone? Uh, that's where I want our focus uh, for a moment. Jesus is in the journey here. Still he is in the journey to Jerusalem. He is headed towards the cross. He is headed towards the final victory on the cross of Calvary. But along the way, he is teaching his disciples some of the most fundamental things of a Christian life. And he has already told, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. You have to take up the cross and you have to follow me. There, are price, there is a price to pay to be a disciple. And now in chapter 17, we have some of the hard sayings again uh, in regard to our Christian life. And that's when, are you a stumbling block or a stepping stone for your fellow Christian brothers and sisters? Are you becoming a hindrance for others to come into the kingdom of God? Are you the inspiration for others to come into the kingdom of God? Is your life becoming a kind of a blinding blinder for them to see Christ? Or is this a window for them to see Christ? Let me read the text before I go into this. Luke 17, verse 1 to 10. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a milestone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. He replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the ship. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, Come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, Prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should we should say we are unworthy servants we have only done our duty jesus is addressing to his disciples about the reality of this world and their responsibility of representing him after he is gone and he says the things that cause people to sin are bound to come. That means there are plenty of things in this world that will cause people to stumble and to fall in sin. Or, In other words, there is no shortage of temptation in this world. There, is, there are temptations to abandon Christ. There are temptations to fall away from Christ. There are temptations to compromise our faith and allow the devil to control our life. There is plenty of room for sin to come into our life. There is no shortage of falling in sin. There are many different ways that we will fall in sin. The Christians and the non-Christians is not the matter here. It's the brothers and sisters who are in the Lord there will come things that will cause you to stumble. 
and it's bound to come. It's going to come. Jesus is not shielding us from the temptations. He is not shielding us from the difficulties of life. He is not shielding us and protecting us in some kind of a vacuum or a bunker. You know, in these days, especially when you talk, hear news about Iran or North Korea or some of these nations, they are digging and digging and building some so deep bunkers that the modern weapons couldn't, cannot penetrate. And America had to change some of the technological uh, techniques, how to develop new weapons to destroy these deep bunkers. Jesus did not leave us into that kind of a protected zone or a safe bunker. He left us into the world. And he says, things are going to come your way. There are things that will cause you to stumble. They will cause you to fall. But then the reality of a real Christian is that woe unto us if we become the means through which other Christians who are coming to the Lord fall into sin. Woe unto us, the disciples, if we are the cause for other people to not to see who Jesus is. Woe unto us if we become the reason for someone to abandon faith. Woe unto us if we become the reason for someone to leave the church or a fellowship. Woe unto us if because of me some, someone does not want to attend this fellowship. People will get hurt. You will get hurt. You are you're going to get hurt. Jesus is not uh, protecting us. Whether you're a young Christian or a mature person, there will be things that will hurt you. There will be things that will cause you to stumble at time. But then, he leaves us with no excuse. And he said, if it comes through you, if you become the stumbling block for someone, the consequences are terrible. He said, it is better to hang or tie a millstone, or millstone, what do you call? The grinding stone in another place. It's kind of a, a, a hundred pound or more than a hundred pound. It's tied on your neck and you're dropped in a deep ocean. It's better in that way. To be drawn with a huge rock in your neck, unable to remove, it is better to be drawn in a deep ocean than to be a person who causes a person stumble in his or her life or falls away in relation to, uh, from relations with Christ or breaks his or her relationship with God because of some Christians. Now the reality is, my friend, as I have said a few weeks ago, the greatest advantage and the disadvantage for the kingdom of God in this world are the Christians. We are supposed to be the advantage for the kingdom of God, but many times we have become the liability. Because of Christians, many people cannot see Christ. That's what Jesus is meaning here. If because of you, if they cannot come to me, if because of you, if they cannot have relationship with me, if because of you, if they cannot enjoy the intimacy with me or develop into the person they could become, then you are going to reap some kind of consequences. On the opposite side, if you become the stepping stone, now, a stumbling block is one that makes you fall, right? Everybody has that experience. A stumbling, it only has to be one stone. A stumbling block has to be just one point of your contact. It doesn't have to be many. But stepping stones, there have to be one more than one. You cannot step in one stone. You have to step one after the other 
and we walk along this Kapchan River and uh, in front of Expo and in all these places, you see there are many, many, many stepping stones. And I was counting the other day, there were about 48 or 49 stepping stones. Me and my wife, wife walk along those rivers and we enjoy stepping on them. Suppose if I stumble in one of them, that's it. It only needs one stone for a person to stumble, but it needs many stones to make a stepping steps so that you can cross over. So if you are the stopping stone, a uh, stepping stone for someone to come to Christ, if you are the window through which that person's eyes are open to see who Christ is, then there is a rejoicing in the kingdom of heaven. So much so, Jesus said, if any of you happen to be my disciple and you go and someone recognizes you as my disciples and gives you a cup of cold water in my name, that person will not lose his reward. Someone gives you a cup of cold water. Jesus said there is a reward for a person of such character. So if you're a stepping stone, there is a reward. There is a blessing. There is a life that is different than a life if you're a stumbling block. If you're a person that becomes a stumbling block for others, you are going to pay. You're going to lose something out of your life. But if you're a stepping stone, you're going to receive. You are going to be given by God the things that our mind cannot comprehend. Our natural eyes cannot even see. Um, logic cannot put that into words. So Jesus is making us a clear statement as how we should live. How we should live. We should live as a stepping stone. Amen. Not as a stumbling block. We should live as those people who are the light of the world. We should live as those who are the salt of the earth. We should live as those who are the witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. The martyrs of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who become the light post for those who are living a dangerous life. So that they can come to safety. We have to live as though we are the shepherds or the keepers of our brothers. We have to keep watch over those who are coming to the Lord. We have to keep watch over our weak brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that's what Jesus is telling. Woe unto you if you cause someone to stumble. Stumbling will come one way or the other. But if it comes through you you are going to lose something out of your life. You're going to have a quality of life that is not worth living. That's the fact. A person who becomes a stumbling block will always have a quality of life that is not worth living. But a stepping stone will have a life that is worth living. How can you become the stepping stone? And number one, he said, therefore, uh, in uh, uh, towards the uh, verse 3 he said so so watch yourselves uh, in other translation it is said pay attention how you live if we want to be the stepping stone for others to come to the knowledge of God, then we have to pay attention the way we are living or examine our life on a daily basis. Examine the way you are living. Examine your relationship with God. Is that right? Are you right with God? And then examine your relationship with your fellow human being. Is that right? Do you love God with all your heart, mind and soul and body and strength? Or do you love your fellow neighbors as yourself? Because that's the key. That is the foundation of Christian life. So if we love God with all our heart, mind and soul, if we love our fellow neighbors as ourselves, then chances are that we will become the stepping stones. Then chances are that we will not become the stumbling block. And as a result, our life will be meaningful. Our life will be worth living. 
Because Jesus has not called us only just for sake of our salvation, my friend. He calls you and I so that we will live a life that is truly life. Amen? Abundant life. A life that has purpose, a life that has meaning, the life that is fulfilled. And that cannot happen simply because I, I only care for my soul. I only think about my soul, my spirit, my salvation, and somehow I want to protect myself in Christ. So I come to church, so I read the Bible, so I do whatever I do so that I would not lose myself. If it is the, that kind of an attitude, then you have misunderstood the call of Christ. The more I focus on myself, the more I'm going to be a stumbling block for others. But on the other hand, Jesus has called us into a lifestyle that is as we sing, I'm, going to willing, I'm willing to lose my life. If I have to lose my life, I'm willing to do it. And Jesus said, anybody who is willing to lose his life will find it. But anybody who is keeping the life for my sake instead of giving it, we lose it. So Jesus has called us to lose our life, to give our life, to do something for the fellow human beings. Because the moment you focus on yourself, then instead of stepping stone, you become a stumbling block. Because somewhere, because I focus on myself, someone is going to hurt me. Someone is going to touch my emotions. Someone is going to take my seat in the church. So someone is going to take my umbrella when it is a rainy day I kept outside. And I am going to be mad at that person. And when I know that who took my umbrella, next time he comes to Sunday, Sunday service, I'm not going to speak to that person. But on the other hand, if you are a person given, you, uh, you've given your life to God and you want to be used by God, you want to receive what God has for you, you want to find out the fullness of life in Christ, if someone takes your seat, you just rejoice for the fact that there was a seat that you could give it. If someone takes your umbrella, you just say, praise God, I had an umbrella and someone is enjoying today. You become delighted for any kind of contribution. Either someone takes advantage of you, even someone takes advantage over you, you don't become bitter. You say, okay, I had it, so they took it. God gave me the ability, so they took it. Someone underestimates you. You just rejoice in the fact that, praise God, I had something, so they didn't read, but I'm happy to have it. So you and I are called into Christian life, not only for ourselves, for our brothers and sisters, for fellow human beings. Can you imagine the very foundations of the gospel of Jesus Christ was given into the hands of these 12 illiterate men, uh, some women as well. And Jesus said, now I am going, now I give you this gospel, now you go and preach to the ends of the world. Had these 12 bunch of people decided not to move out of Jerusalem, decided not to preach this gospel, decided not to give their life for the cause of Christ, if they decided to shut their mouth, if they decided to go back into fishing business, if they decided to go back into their own tax collecting job and never gave their life for God or for others, you and I would not be here today. But Jesus Christ, God, the creator of the universe, put this gospel into the hands of men like us so that we would live that gospel as though we are the ambassador of the kingdom of God. And our job is to represent the best possible, possible picture of that kingdom. And that we do by being a stepping stone for a fellow Christian and fellow brothers and sisters not by being a stumbling block. You look for chances to minister others. You look for opportunity. You, you, if you don't have any chance to minister others, you begin to pray, Lord, how can I minister? Which way can I do? What can I say to this person or that person? How can I become the person you wanted me to be? How can I serve you? Or how can I serve my fellow brothers and sisters? 
you pay attention to your life, how you live. You evaluate your life and you examine your relationship with God and your relationship with fellow human beings. You pay attention that your life is in line with the Word of God. If you find your life not in line with the Word of God, you ask God to forgive you. You, you ask God to give you the grace to be able to live in line with the Word of God. Secondly, once you know that you are living your life in line with the Word of God, you have a heart filled with the love of God, you have a heart filled love for the people, and then if you see, if you see some Christian brothers and sisters living in sin, if you see some Christian brothers and sisters stumbling over something, or making others to stumble, or themselves stumbling over something, then Jesus gives us this responsibility of rebuking that person. Now, we think that rebuke means go and give him or hear her the peace of your mind, right? No, the word rebuke is also can be restore, redeem, resurrect, protect that person so that they do not remain in that fallen state. So go and rebuke that person. That means let that brother or sister who is living in sin recognize the danger that he or she is in. Because sin will always result in pain and hurt. So when you see a fellow Christian brother and sister living in sin, you are not going to rebuke that person because you're a righteous person. You're not going to rebuke that person because you don't want the church to have a bad reputation. You don't go and rebuke that person because you think that the non-Christians will look at and they will blame you as well. You rebuke a person. You confront a person who is in sin because you know that his or her sin is going to harm him or her. He or she is going to lose something in life as a result of a lifestyle of sin. So you are filled with compassion. When you approach a person who is making a mistake, if you approach with the spirit of adjustment, then you're going to create more trouble. You are going to stumble that person. But if you're filled with compassion, if you love that person, if you have a love and compassion towards that person, then you go and say, brother and sister, I think you need to repent. Sometimes I'm very harsh to my wife and son at home. Not because I hate them, but because I love them more. I wouldn't care if I see same thing in someone else's life. Because I don't love them as much as I love my wife and my son. That's the fact. I may go in a nice way. I, if I see some of your children making some mistakes, I may say in a very diplomatic ways, but if I see my son doing, I would be direct. Because I want my son to live a life that is free from hurt or harm. Because I love him, I will rebuke him. But if I don't love him, my rebuke will turn into poison or some terrible things. So same way, when you see some Christian brothers and sisters living in sin, if you, if you avoid them, oh, oh, who am I to judge? Oh, who am I to condemn someone? I'm here to only encourage, like there are some preachers who preach like that. They never say that you should repent from your sin. They'll say, okay, you just believe God. So when you see someone making a mistake, Jesus says, go to that person in love and rebuke that person or explain to the person the danger of living in sin. Sin, no matter how small or big, no matter what kind of color it has, it will create hurt and pain in your life and my life. So if you see sin in my life, if you love me enough, you will come to me with the love of God and you will tell me you're making a mistake. And if I see sin in your life, if I see you making mistake and if I love you enough, I would be daring to come to you and say, I think you need to change your course of action. 
you need to change your behavior because otherwise you will get hurt. So are you a stepping stone or a stumbling block? If you want to be a stepping stone, have the love of God in your heart and then go to the person who is not able to live life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If instead of condemning that person, instead of avoiding that person, face that person, confront that person in love. And you may restore. In James chapter 5, if you go there, if you restore someone, you have done a great job. It covers the multitude of sins. The love of God covers the multitude of sins. You restore that person. So our job is to look for those people, those brothers and sisters who need a helping hand for them to return. Not with a judgmental attitude, but with the love of God. Not with self-righteousness, but with humility. So first, pay attention to your own life. If your life is not worthy of the gospel of God, if people don't have the confidence in you as a Christian, then you go to that person, they will not listen to you. Therefore, I have to examine my life in the light of the word of God. Am I right? Am I living right in line with God's word? Or am I just uh, fooling myself? So when I live in line with the Word of God, I'll be loving God with all my heart. I will never go against the will of God. And I will love my fellow brothers and sisters. And because of that, when I see a brother or sister making a mistake, I will go to him or her and say, I think you have to change your action. And they will listen. And not a guarantee. They may never listen. They may, they may rebel against you. They may say, who are you? It's okay. That's all right. That's the part of the game. Jesus was never afraid to offend the people when it was the right thing to do. You are not going to uh, rebuke a person because you are righteous or something. You love that person so much and you see the person destroying his life or her life and you approach that person with the love of God. If they repent, Jesus said, if they repent. Next is, if they repent then forgive. If they don't repent, don't forgive. <laughs> First, you pay attention to your own life. Second, rebuke or re restore the brothers and sisters. Third, forgive them when they repent. Forgive them without any condition attached. Now, there are systems in churches that if uh, some members falls in adultery or some kind of immorality, then the church has a discipline committee. Uh, they have a discipline process. They say, okay, now for six months you are under suspension from fellowship or you are under probation or this and that. No, Jesus does not attach any condition. If your brother sins against you and you confront that brother in love and he repents and comes back to you and says, I'm sorry, you forgive. And in, in Matthew's Gospel, if chapter, in, in 18, it is Peter. He said, how long should I, should I forgive, Lord? It was Peter in the air also. How long? And Jesus said, here, if he says seven times, if your brother sins seven times in one day, and you go and tell you have sinned against me, and he says, I'm sorry, you forgive. Seven times. In one day, if it is in one month or one year, or you can at least understand. In seven, uh, one day, seven time, if he or she sins against you and says, I'm sorry, you have to forgive. You have no option. How about husband and wives? How many times do you say sorry to one another? That means if he or she passes the limit, okay, now it is the last time. Seven time you have done it. Now <laughs> eight time. Is that what Jesus is telling? <laughs> you cannot offend someone more than eight times a day. <laughs> Jesus is talking about, in Matthew he says seven times seven. That means 77 times. So you divide that sometimes, 449 times sometimes they say. 
what Jesus is telling is that you have no permission to hold bitterness in your heart. That means all the time you forgive. It's not, it's not that when he returns and you forgive. You don't have bitterness in your heart. You are a person of forgiveness. You have received forgiveness from God. And from then onward, whoever comes against you, whoever hurts you or sins against you, you do not hold grudge against that person. And you don't sit there grinding your teeth and saying, when will I get that person? You do not hold bitterness within your heart. It's forgive all the time. Seven times seven or seven times in a, in a day. It is, the meaning is that you have to forgive. That's it. You have no choice not to forgive. You cannot choose between forgiving and not forgiving. And if you fail to forgive your fellow brothers and sisters, if you fail to forgive someone who has hurt you, then you have become a stumbling block, not only for that person, for yourself. Because then you go to the Lord's Prayer and you say, Heavenly Father, and then go and go on, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Have you forgiven your debtor? That means you're telling God, don't forgive me because I have not forgiven. Forgive me just as I have forgiven. <coughs> Since I have not forgiven, then I'm asking God not to forgive me. So, in not forgiving, in, in allowing the bitterness within your heart, you are yourself stumbling and you make others to stumble. And therefore, Jesus is asking us to pay attention carefully how you live your life. Are you harboring a bitterness against anyone? Okay, if they come and repent, I forgive, but they never came back. What can I do? I think we have to follow Christ. Nobody came repenting to him when he was hung upon that cross. Nobody said, oh, Jesus, sorry, we hung you upon that cross. But he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is the spirit of forgiveness. I think you have uh, watched a movie called Machine Gun Preacher. Have you watched? It's kind of uh, controversial, but uh, based upon a true story of a man who was very a vile man while he was in his younger days, didn't go to study, didn't study at all, and <coughs> joined the gun and the drug and all kind of immoral culture. But one day, God touched his life and he turned his life around. And then in about in, in the middle 90s, he took a mission trip to Africa, Sudan, and he saw the tragedy and the terror that the rebel groups were doing among the innocent people, and he gave his life for this rescuing children in Sudan. He went back home, sold his business and houses and all those things. They were about to separate. His wife said, no, I, you serve God, but this is too much. But he was determined to serve God in Africa, so he began an orphanage and rescuing children from these militant groups. In the movie, at one point, he could not forgive these terror groups who were just massacring the children, uh, mutilating these little ones, burning their houses, shooting them on sight, and he just couldn't, couldn't take on himself, and he became so mad he wanted to buy a vehicle that would take him into the uh, rough terrains and he went to America and he visited some big businessman and he said, I need money to buy this vehicle. And they said, no, the economy is down and we have no profit and all. And he was so mad he threatens them. And nobody gives him money. And he says, God has abandoned me. He was filled with anger, hate against this rebel group, this terror group in Africa. He was filled with anger against these rich Americans who were willing to spend thousands of dollars for a barbecue, barbecue party, but they couldn't give him a few thousand to buy his vehicle. 
So he goes back to Africa. He was in the verge of killing himself. He said, it's enough. In the movie, with the best possible research, these movie makers, they confess that the story is based upon the real life experiences of, uh, his name is Sam Childers, you can see him. A young boy of about 13 years old walks into the room where Sam was about to kill himself, sits beside, this boy had never spoken ever since he rescued him from the jungle. This boy sits beside him on the same bed where he was sitting and about to suit himself. When he saw the boy coming in, he hid the gun. And the boy looks at him and he said, My father was like you, a very strong man. But LRA, that the Lord's resistant army, came at night and they killed him. They sought him and we me, my mother, and my brother, three of us were watching. And then they made my mother to kneel down and gave me the, one of the, the messages and said, if you and your brother want to live, you have to kill your mother. And the young boy says, so I killed my mother to save me and my brother's life. But you know, even though they have taken my family out of me, but they have not been able to take my heart. I have not given them my heart. You too should not give your heart to them because the moment you hate them, you have given your heart to them. If you hate your enemy, you have given your heart to them. Even though I have done these things, they have done these terrible things, but they have not taken my heart. I still have hope in me. It's a simple story of a man who is struggling to rescue their children. But the, the point is that the moment you refuse to forgive, you have given your heart. The moment you hold grudges against someone, you have allowed the root of bitterness to grow within you, to destroy your life, to take away whatever was good and beautiful in your life. And that is when the disciples recognize that Jesus is asking the most difficult thing to do in this world. And then they said, look at it. The apostle said to him, Lord, increase our faith. You cannot forgive without faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. You need divine assistance to live a life of forgiveness. You cannot forgive as a human being. You may forgive to a certain extent, but you need the faith of God to live a life that God has called you to live. The disciples knew this is impossible to ask, uh, to do. Seven times the brother comes and says, I'm sorry, and then I forgive. It is impossible. That means all the time to live in complete forgiveness, it is impossible. And then they said, increase our faith, Lord. We cannot do. And Jesus replies to them, when did they say increase our faith? He said, okay. If you have faith, you can say to this mulberry tree, get uprooted and it will obey. Which means, I think he's connecting here with the root of bitterness that Hebrews writer talks about in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15. In, in Hebrews 14, 15, he's, uh, it's written, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Jesus, for out of context, he says, if you speak to this tree by faith, it will obey you. If you have faith in Christ, if your faith is placed upon the work of Christ, then impossible will become possible. Your enemies will cease to exist. And you will be able to put the words of Christ into real life. When he says, pray for those who persecute you, bless those who curse you. When you see your enemy hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And that way you become the stepping stone, not a stumbling block. Are you struggling to forgive people?
Jesus said, ask God, ask to increase your faith. Increase your faith. And when you have come to the place of forgiveness, when you realize that you could forgive your enemies, then he says, finally, he gives an example of a servant. You have a servant, he does the job. Do you thank him for what he did? He says, no. A servant is supposed to do what he's told. In the same way, he tells to his disciple, you ought to also, in verse 10, he says, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. That means, uh, sometimes I tell you, when you live a spiritual victoriously, I mean, if you forgive your enemies, uh, you give a lot of things for the kingdom of God, your spiritual life is perfect, then you are the... Uh, you are becoming a candidate to fall again. The moment you think that your spiritual life is perfect, you have allowed yourself to fall into the sin of spiritual pride. If you have forgiven some horrendous person, you think, wow, I'm very good. I can forgive that person. That means you have fallen into pride. The moment you say, ah, I'm good, I'm doing very good, I'm, I'm becoming a faithful servant, and you allowed yourself to fall into sin again, into sin of spiritual pride. And then Jesus said, you ought to say, I'm only doing what I'm told. I am an undeserving servant. Humble yourself. You want to be a stepping stone? Have the attitude of humility. Humble yourself. No matter how talented or a gifted person you may be, no matter how great personality you may have, but humble yourself so that through humility you will touch many more lives and you will become a stepping stone for many to come to the knowledge of God. So Jesus is asking us to examine our life so that we don't, we don't live careless lives. You need to watch your actions, you need to watch your words, you need to watch your behaviors, you, know, you, you need to set an example that will glorify God and also bring other people into the kingdom of God. And then when you see some Christian brothers and sisters falling in sin or making mess of their life, approach to them with love and confidence and tell if sin is there, tell sin it is sin. And if it is a brokenness, tell it is a brokenness, you need to repent. And then when they come, forgive them with no condition attached, no string attached. And when you are able to forgive them, or when you are not able to forgive, fall on your face and say, God, I need faith. Increase my faith. And when God gives you victory in your spiritual life, then humble yourself again and say, God, I have only done what you told me to do. Jesus said, love your enemy. So if you forgive your enemy, what great is that? You're just doing what he told you to do. If you restore a brother, if you brought someone to Christ, what, what great job have you done? Nothing as such, but only you did what he told you to do. We are only servants, undeserving servants. By His grace, we are able to do. So when we do these things and humble ourselves, many people will one day come to meet you when you get to heaven. And they will say, thank you. Thank you. Because of you, I am here today. When you live a life of a stepping stone, either in your service or your character or your word or speech or whatever it is, in the kingdom of heaven, you will have many people come around and surround you. There will be rejoicing when you get to heaven. Amen? Let us close our eyes and think about the words of Christ.